Hello and welcome to another lesson about language and social issues. This is the second lesson that I'm going to do about the development of regional dialects of American English. So if you haven't watched the first part, go back and watch the first part before watching this part. So in the last lesson, we talked about the initial colonization of the east coast of what's now the United States and how, and how the colonists in different regions came from different dialect groups within England and Great Britain. And in particular, we talked about how the coastal region was settled mostly by English colonists, while the inland region was settled by Scots, Irish, and Germans. And we also talked about how the coastal areas were settled by English colonists from different parts of England. So in New England, we had a dialect region that was settled mostly by people from the southeast part of England, while the Pennsylvania region was settled mostly by people from a northern England dialect region, and the south was settled by a mix of southern English dialects. Now, sometime shortly after independence, the area known as the Western Territory, which is between the Appalachians and the Mississippi, started to be colonized by Europeans. And if we look at where people from the East Coast ended up settling in the Western Territory, they mostly all just went straight west. So people from the inland regions of New England mostly went straight into Michigan and then later up into Wisconsin, whereas people from the South mostly stayed out of that sort of Great Lakes region. But there were also settlers from this Midlands, Pennsylvania dialect, which was erotic dialect, remember, um, who also just went basically straight west. And they merged in this region with people who were speaking southern dialect. And we can still see this sort of straight western migration in our modern dialect map of American English dialect regions, right? You, you can see where those Midland dialects and those Northern dialects and the Southern dialects just went straight west in this part of the country. But let's look at where the colonists who settled what we now think of as the Western United States came from. If we look at all of the sort of famous trails that brought people across the Rocky Mountains, the Oregon Trail, the Mormon Trail, the Santa Fe Trail. These all originate in sort of Midland dialect regions. Now, people traveled these trails from different dialect areas, but most of these people were coming from a sort of a Midlands dialect region, which is why the Western dialects now tend to resemble a Midlands sort of dialect more than they resemble a Southern dialect. But once they got to the other side of the Rocky Mountains, they were physically cut off from the rest of the United States for quite a while until the transcontinental railroads really started being established. And so we get this dialect line that shows up right at where the Rocky Mountains were, because it was fairly hard to travel across the Rocky Mountains. And this is the birth of the modern Western dialect region. If we look at how this sort of north central part of what's now the United States was colonized, the colonists who were coming from the United States were from almost exclusively the northern dialect region. However, this region was also settled fairly heavily by people from Germany and Scandinavia who came and settled in the western Great Lakes region and in this north central part of the United States. And so there's fairly heavy influence from these German and Scandinavian languages in these parts of the country. And that influence from the northern dialect and from Germany and Scandinavia cuts off these dialects from the Midlands dialect region, but also separates it from the New England dialect region, which continued to more closely resemble the English dialects spoken in southeastern England, because they did not have this influence from Germany and Scandinavia. And so this is what creates a northern dialect region, which is separate from New England and separate from the Midlands. When people started spreading into areas like Texas, however, most of these colonists came from the south. In the Texas region, there was also a pretty good infusion of new immigrants from Germany, which is partly what leads to the distinction between what we think of as a Texas Southern accent and what we think of as a more Eastern Southern accent. And this led to another dialect boundary between that Midlands dialect, which was spreading west toward the Rockies, and the Southern dialect, which stuck to the south. And with that, we have what are now essentially our modern dialect regions in the United States. We have a northern dialect region, 
We have a New England dialect region, which is separate because New England did not have the sort of German and Scandinavian influence that the northern dialect region had. We have the Midlands dialect region, which stretches all the way from Pennsylvania in toward the, the middle of the country. We have the Western dialect region, and we have the Southern dialect region. And this all has to do with who the colonists were who spread to these different areas of the country. All right, so there's another part of the story that we haven't addressed that much, and that is the influence that other languages that were spoken in what is now the United States have had on the development of our modern American English dialects. So the first group of languages that was obviously present when European colonists started to take over the continent were the American Indian languages. And there were over 300 of these languages in what is now the United States at the time when Europeans first started to invade. Also present in what's now the United States were other colonial languages. So for example, Spanish was present in the areas that were previously colonized by Spain, such as especially the American Southwest and Florida. French was present in the areas that had previously been colonized by France, in particular, in particular the Louisiana Territory. And German was present because of the large number of German colonists who arrived alongside the English-speaking colonists from Britain. Now we'll talk a lot more about these other languages in a couple of weeks when we start talking about language diversity in the United States, but right now we're just going to talk about the influence that these languages had on our modern English dialects. We're not going to be talking about how these languages are spoken today. Now before I start talking about the influence that these languages have had on modern American English, I'm going to talk a little bit about some general terminology that we use in linguistics to talk about colonization and language. Now usually in a situation of colonization we have two types of languages. The first type of language is called a superstratum language, and these are the languages that are brought by colonizers. Um, these languages tend to have a lot of economic and political power because the colonizers have economic and political power. Um, and so speaking these superstratum languages is important for everyone's success and survival in the region. In situations of colonization, there are usually also substratum languages, which are the languages that are already spoken in the colonized region by the indigenous population. These languages often persist because they are sources of cultural identity and heritage for the indigenous population, but they often don't have much influence on the superstratum language that was brought by the colonizers. We look at the situation when English was being spread west. Um, at a regional level, English was always the superstratum language and other languages, any other languages, formed the substratum. And so if we think about this situation, English speakers didn't bother to learn the local languages. They weren't a source of cultural heritage to them, and the superstratum language was all that they needed to get by. So they didn't bother to become bilingual, um, and non-English speakers faced a lot of pressure to learn to speak like colonizers, because if you wanted to take advantage of any of that economic or political power held by English speakers, you had to be able to speak English. Um, and so the result is that the influence of other languages on regional American English is minor. The substratum languages often contributed place names, plant names for plants and animals, names for geological features and weather patterns. Things from this is what sort of standard regional varieties of American English have borrowed into the language. Um, and you'll notice that these are borrowings that we usually take to sort of fill a gap in our lexicon. If we don't have a name for that place, we might take it from the substratum language. If we don't have a name for that plant, we might take it from the substratum language. But they're not taking a lot of words for things that we already have words for. Let's look at some of the words that have been contributed to American English by the substratum languages. So many of the names for the states originally came from Native American languages of different families. So this in this map, all of the states that have been colored have names that come from Native languages. Um, several of our states are also named for other substratum languages that are other colonized languages. California, Nevada, Colorado, Montana, and Florida are all from Spanish, and Louisiana is from French. So these are place names that were borrowed from substratum languages. We also have a lot of words that are borrowed from Native American languages that 
are words for different types of animals that English speakers encountered in America for the first time. So caribou, chuck wallow, which is a kind of a lizard, coho and sockeye varieties of salmon. There's also names for different kinds of trees, hickory and pecan, different sorts of tools that were being used. So toboggans and mackinaws, which is a type of jacket and actually named after a region. And different types of food. So hominy, which is a type of fermented corn, was also borrowed from Native American languages. Um, we borrowed the same sorts of things from colonial languages that formed a substratum in what's now the United States. So from Spanish, we get alligator. Um, we get arroyo, which is a geological formation. Um, we get lasso, which is another tool. We get quesadilla, which is some more food. There are a lot of borrowings into American English that have a long history of being borrowed between different languages. So, for example, our word, for, our word bayou, which is a type of a swamp, comes to us from French, but the French actually borrowed the same word from Choctaw. Similarly, condor, for the large type of vulture, comes to us from Spanish, but they borrowed that word from Quechua. Um, poncho comes to us from Spanish, but that was also borrowed from down in South America. So many of the words that we've borrowed from these substratum languages have been borrowed because we didn't have a word for that thing and another language did. Now there is, of course, one other group of substratum languages that we haven't discussed yet. And this is because this group of substratum languages is a little more complicated. These are the languages that were spoken by the black population in the early United States. Now, those African Americans who were born in the United States often spoke regional Englishes, but the enslaved population that was brought directly from Africa spoke a huge variety of African languages. Much of the enslaved population was also brought from the Caribbean, where they were already speaking Caribbean Creoles, many of which were based on French, and they were also speaking a variety of foreign Englishes from places like the Caribbean. This creates a really complicated substratum of language groups, which is just too much for us to talk about this week. We will talk a lot more about this next week where we will have a whole lesson on African-American English varieties. But just be aware that this is another substratum that did influence in particular the development of Southern English. So let's summarize the last couple lessons and what I really want you to take away from these lessons. So the first thing that I really would like you to take away is that there was not ever one original American English. Even when people first arrived in America speaking English, they were already speaking different varieties of English. So it's not at all surprising that we would have a variety of dialects in America today. The next thing that I want you to take away is more general. And it's this idea that when people travel, they bring their language along with them. And so the history of who traveled where can be reflected in the language that we use today. Lastly, I'd like you to remember this distinction between a superstratum language and a substratum language in terms of how the two types of languages influence each other. All right, so that's our lesson on the development of regional dialects in the United States, and I hope you enjoyed it.